chapter 13 with me this morning, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. We stand and open the pages of the Word of God. Now think about what I just said. The Word of God. Not the Word of man, but the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. The divine text says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, it is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Father, this is your holy word, Lord. I'm nothing but a creature. I pray that you'd give me unction to preach it this morning. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. And of course you know the word charity here is the old uh, King James. Uh, at that, uh, the King James uh, usage of the word love. And as if you've heard many times, there's a lot of different types of love in the Bible. The love of God is the agape love, or agapeo, the love of God. It's a different kind of love than anything else that anyone could ever know in this creation. The Apostle Paul spells it out for you in 1 Corinthians 13 and says here to the church at Corinth, he defines what true love is all about. These people spoke in tongues. These people manifested the gifts. These people had interrelation with each other, blaming each other, taking each other to court. These people had people uh, shacked up with their father's wife. These people had all kinds of uh, uh, vices and problems. And so the Apostle Paul, in the midst of all of it, in 1 Corinthians 13, said, let me tell you about love. Some of you say you love. Some of you say you understand what love is about. Let me define it for you. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he begins to define what love is all about. We have folks in this house this morning, no doubt in my mind, that are starved to death for love. You've lusted, and you've had people uh, had sh shallow, very shallow relationship with you. Some of you were denied the love of your mother and your father, your parents, a family member. Some of you were denied love from a wife or a husband. And some of you have never known love in this world. You've never known it. You never have. You've never found it. You've searched for it. Some of you are searching for love and don't even know it. You don't know what you're looking for right now. And your life is empty. It's void of something meaning. And you sit around and you go through life. You go to work. You go home. And you deal with this and deal with that. But inside there's a great big hole. And it's just empty. And the only one that can fill that hole is Almighty God. For when God made a man, breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, man would never be a complete being without God in his life. And that's the only way you'll ever have any understanding and have any real meaning in life is to have a relationship with the Lord. And I preached about that last Sunday morning. God wants to have a relationship with you. But it's going to be built upon something here that uh, nobody can understand until you experience it. The Bible says not so much the fact that God is love. The Bible said God is love. And when you look at it in that sense, you understand that's not something He's doing. That's what He is. He's love to us in every sense of the word, in every definition of the word, in every nuance of the understanding. God Almighty is God Almighty. And there's not another like Him. And I'm glad when I met him, I didn't meet a mere man. I met one that is far infinitely greater and above what I am. 
or could ever hope to be. I met the Lord God Almighty. I met the creator of the universe. I met the Son of God. I met the Savior of mankind. When I met him, he changed my life completely. Before I met him in 1973, I was a piece of dung. I was a piece of garbage. I wasn't worth the powder and lead to blow me to hell. But when I met him, he changed me completely from what I was by the grace of God into what I am today. And I give him all glory for it. I'm not one of those preachers who gets up in front of you and carries on with some long, pious-sounding attitude. And looks like he's some great thing. Folks, I am what I am by the grace of God. But I know what the love of God is. I've experienced the love of God. I want you to look at first of all in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 at some of the attributes of love. In verse 4 it says, love suffereth long. God has suffered long with us. A marriage will suffer long if there's real love in it. It'll endure hardships. It'll endure problems. It'll endure woes. Ch children and their parents will have a relationship if there's love involved in that. Even though the children try the parents' patience, the, the love, the love that's, available, that's there in that, in that relationship between a parent and a child will endure. It'll endure anything that this earth can throw it in. Verse 4, the Bible says that love is humble. It is, says that it is, vaunteth not itself. Real love is humility manifested in the life of an individual. Verse number 4, love, uh, the Bible teaches us here, satisfies the soul. And the soul will never be satisfied without the love of God and God in their life. In verse number 5, the Bible teaches that love will submit itself unto the hand of God and God's ownership of our lives. He owns us, folks. We do not own ourselves, and no man is an island to himself. Then in verse number 5, love will manifest itself in self-control, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. And so in verse number 5, love is also pure in heart. Notice that it says, thinketh no evil. Some of you think everybody thinks about you like you think about them. <laughs> you think they're after you like you're after them. They think you're trying to, you think they're trying to take you down like you're trying to take them down. That's because your mind is perverted. And when you come to God, you think your relationship with the Lord is built on your own perverted nature. And it has never been and never will be. It's hard for a fallen creature to understand that when they come into the presence of Almighty God, they're are coming into the presence of one that is pure, 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 and holy. Amen, amen, amen. So love is pure in heart. This is why the Lord said that pure in heart shall see God. In verse number 6, the Bible teaches that love rejoices in the truth. Don't tell me that you love me or you love God if you reject the truth. Because if you truly have the love of God in your soul, you will receive the truth. Then in verse number 8, to sum up everything the apostle has said, he says that love, charity, never faileth. It'll make it through the storm. It'll make it through the trial. It'll make it through the hardships. It'll make it through the times that you can't make it. But if the love of God is dwelling in your soul, you'll make it. You'll make it. You'll make it. He that hath begun a good work and you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. I am persuaded, the apostle says, in the book of Romans chapter number 8. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah to God. I have confidence in God's word and I have confidence in him that he said that he would never leave me nor forsake me. The love of God is defined, therefore, as the presence and power and security and hope of God actively working in your life. It is not an empty word that needs to be defined. It is a present reality that you grasp. If you know that God loves you, you can face tomorrow. If you know that God loves you, you can deal with today. If you know that God loves you, you can overcome that that you could never overcome on your own. If you know that God loves you, whatever comes your way and tries to destroy you in this world, you'll have victory. You'll stand on the grave of your enemy one day and glorify God and shout His holy praises. So if you know the love of God, you already have victory. And once it becomes a reality in your life, you will never fail because he will never fail. And the apostle Peter said it plainly, you will never fail. Aren't you glad someone is able to keep that which you've committed to him against that day? 
Aren't you glad that your salvation is not a, it's not a, an emotional thing? I feel saved today, but I don't feel saved tomorrow. I feel all right now, but I don't feel okay enough in the future. Or yesterday I didn't feel, I don't care how you feel. What did God's word say? He said, I am able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Uttermost means from the depth to the height. It means from the darkness to the light. It means in the worst situation to the best. He is able to save you for what he started. He will finish. He will consummate. And nothing will stay the hand of God. That's the kind of God I serve today. The love of God is his relationship with me. His relationship with me is built upon the fact that God loves me. Not because I'm lovable. Not because I can even return that love. It is built upon the fact that God loves me because God is love. And I've received him into my soul. Now let's look at some practical applications of that love. Since that love is a real reality. It's not an empty word. It's not, it's not some kind of just uh, of cliches and hackneyed expressions. It is something that matters. When this lady sang to you a few moments ago, could you sense what was going on inside her soul? When this brother was singing to you a few minutes ago, could you sense that there's something going on? How many of you understood today that you're not in a house of performance? This is not a theater. Neither one of these people performed before you. It is not an orchestrated event. What you saw was spontaneous. It arose from the heart and came forth and you were here to hear it. That is good. That is good. That is good. I didn't come into the house of God to be entertained with religious entertainment. You can get that all week long. You come to the house of God to worship Almighty God. And if you've been born again, then you have every basis to worship God and every reason to worship Him. Now what is the application of this love, preacher? What do you mean by that? Applied. John chapter number 3 and verse number 16 says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. He's not talking about earth. He's not talking about the dirt. He's not talking about the creation. He's talking about mankind. For God so loved mankind. He loved human beings. He loved that creature that was taken from the dust of the ground that he breathed into his nostrils. For God so loved the world that is irrespective of a race, irrespective of education, irrespective of wealth, irrespective of station in life. He loved the world. John Calvin could never get it right. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loved all mankind and would have all men to be saved. For by the grace of God he tasted death for every man. So a practical application of that scripture is simply this. Of love. That he loved the world. He loved you when you were unlovable. He loved you when you were deep in sin. He loved you while you were in rebellion against God. He loved you when you were completely, totally ignorant of the fact that he even existed. He loved you while you were going away from God. He loved you before you ever made a moment of motion toward Him. He still loved you. The love of Christ compelleth me or constraineth me, the Apostle Paul said. He said, it burns within my soul. It moves within my heart. It takes hold of my very being. It is the love of Christ, the Apostle Paul said, that wakes me up in the morning and gives me direction through the day. It causes me to understand my relationship with the Lord. So the Bible said, for God so loved the world. That's easy to understand, my friend, if you think you're lovable. It's easy to understand if you think you've been good all your life. It's easy to understand if you are of this generation today who goes about and they're full of themselves and all they think about is themselves and oh how in love they are with themselves. You hear it puked out from the pulpit week after week after week. But friend, there is nothing lovable about me. And I guarantee you today if I ask your wife, husbands, they she could find plenty of warts about you that aren't lovable. And men, I'm sure that you could find much to say about your wife that is not lovable. But I'll tell you the truth. The truth is he's still loved you. He loved you in spite of it because God is love. The application is like this. It says in Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 9, the Word of God says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death 
for every man. Now, folks, that scripture is a powerful statement. Say, what do you mean, preacher? He just died. No, 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 no. He didn't just die. He laid his life down. But while he was on the cross at Calvary, I can't explain it. Don't expect a human being to do it. But somehow or another, he tasted the death of every last human being that ever lived on the face of this earth. That means you as a sinner. That's talking about everything you ever did. In plain of words, it's talking about the death you would die without God Almighty in your life. For the fact that He tasted my death meant that He took my death. Hallelujah. The fact that He tasted my death meant that He took my death. Are you listening? That means that when I come down to the time to cross the Jordan, I go over to the other side. I go the way of all the earth. I won't have to leave this world like the unsaved. For the unsaved man will taste his own death. The unsaved man will face eternity as he is. He'll die as he is. The Lord Jesus Christ tasted the death of Ted Bundy. He was a serial killer. And before he was executed in Florida, he refused to give the names of the location, the location of some of the men, the women rather, that he had killed. Ted Bundy liked to take young girls and he liked to kill them. And he liked to bury their bodies scattered all over the country. But there are a number of those girls to this very day that the parents have no idea where their daughter's body is buried because Bundy would not tell them. Ted Bundy died. Ted Bundy went out into eternity. Ted Bundy faced the dark damnation of an eternity without God. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ tasted Ted Bundy's death. That meant that Christ our Lord Jesus faced at his death on the cross at Calvary. What Bundy looked off into when he looked into eternity without God. I can't imagine what went through that man's soul and mind as they strapped him in that chair. They put a thing around his head. They put the implement here. You can see his body after they burned him. And there are the marks across his forehead where Ted Bundy was electrocuted. And there in Florida, they put him in that chair and then they threw the switch. And they ran thousands of volts through his body. But while he was sitting in that chair, before he drew his last breath, there is no doubt in my mind that Ted Bundy realized there was something waiting for him on the other side. And the Lord Jesus Christ tasted Ted Bundy's death. Are you listening? That's a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. What a God. What a Lord that we serve today that is able to take into his own body. He became sin for us. Hallelujah to God. He became sin for us who knew no sin. My blessed Lord Jesus Christ, my friend there at the cross at Calvary, became Ted Bundy, taking Ted Bundy's damnation and sin and wrath into his own body on the tree so he could feel in himself what you are awaiting so that when your time comes to go over to the other side and leave this world, you won't have to leave it like Ted Bundy did. You won't have to look into eternity like he did. You'll cross over that, over that river we talk about where the angels carry you into the presence of God with all of that condemnation lifted from your soul and the light rolls back. Amen. Did you know there's two pure things that I know of? There may be more, but there are two pure things that that Bible talks about. Purity, number one, is the light that God dwells in that no man hath seen or no man can see. That's a light, my friend, that you can never see with your physical eyes. But according to Hebrews chapter number one, that light that dwells where God dwells, a ray of light came shining forth from that light, and you could see that ray of light. That ray of light that shined forth from that light that you cannot see was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the light that shines of the one who dwells in eternity. He's the glory of the one who dwells in eternity. He's the express image of his person who dwells in eternity. And we can see the light that my friend, you see the light. I, hallelujah. I see it today. I've seen Jesus who shines my friend in my heart. There's another pure thing. 
And that pure thing is the love of God. It cannot be corrupted. There's no darkness in it. It cannot be perverted. It can never be taken. God never gives it to a man to use as he pleases. He only manifests it forth as God does his work. That is pure, friend. If the love of God has ever touched your soul, you ought to be shouting praise and God for something good has happened to you. Something good has moved in your heart. The love of God has taken hold of you and there's nothing greater than that. He loved a sorry low down dog and he saved him in 1973. Hallelujah. He tasted the death of the rapist. Oh, he tasted the death of the thief. He tasted the death of the liar. He tasted the death of the fornicator. He tasted the death of the religionist. He tasted the death of the agnostic. He tasted the death of the atheist. And so my friend, he tasted the death of every man. In plain words, if you were to draw up a litany of all the sins that every human being could possibly commit, every one of them, put them in your book, line them up, draw them up. The Lord Jesus Christ tasted every single one of them. For he tasted the death of every one who commits that sin. Amen. What a God. So if you came into this house this morning laden with sin, dragging your self-righteousness with you, pumped up with your pompous pride or beaten to death by the devil. No hope with God, no hope of ever being saved. Satan has perverted your heart to the point to where you don't think that God would ever hear your prayer. I want you to remember something. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, underline that whosoever, underline that, capitalize it, put it in red. Make it 24 point type compared to 10 point type. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. God sent his not and son into the world not to condemn it. Christ didn't have to come to condemn it for the world was condemned already. Then I want you to look at another application of it and I'll come to a close. Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number six. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. This is instruction. This is God teaching and instructing his children. This is God preparing you to walk with him. This is God that wants to talk to you in the intimacy of your heart. He wants to commune with you, friend. He wants that personal, intimate fellowship with you when he made man he made man for his own glory amen when he made man he didn't make man for man's glory he made it for his own all things were made by him and for him hallelujah the flower that blooms in the forest that no human being has ever seen god sees it the things that dwell in the depths of the ocean that no human being even knows exist God knows it. As far as the universe expands, I don't know how far it is. He does. There may be galaxies out there and planets out there and places out there that would boggle the human mind that in our lifetimes or a thousand lifetimes we'll never see, never know. But he knows it. All things were made by him and he's a big God. He's a lot bigger than my mind. <laughs> Is your mind limiting God? Is your the only relationship you have with the Lord? Is how you can think? Boy, you're arrogant. You got it all figured out. You got God reduced down. And you've got him laid out and you've explained him. Oh, my dear friend, can I call you a fool? There's so much more to him than a human being could ever learn in a thousand lifetimes. Yes, he's a great God. Yes, he is. He started in 1973 with me, and there have been times since then I've fallen. Oh, preacher, what did you do? None of your business. That's pretty plain, isn't it? So what do you mean fell? I wasn't where I should have been. I wasn't always full of the Holy Ghost. I wasn't always on top of the mountain. There have been lapses in my faith. There have been times that I've been tried and I failed, but he didn't fail me. 
Since God saved me in 1973, I haven't always lived up to what God expected of me. I haven't always been a sterling example of the character of God. I've come short. And I identify with the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter number 1 when he said, and I'll paraphrase him, of all the sinners on the face of the earth, have teeth. That's not just empty talk. He meant what he said. Amen. I'm chief. But he said, I should be a pattern for them that should hereafter believe on him. In other words, you take the life of the Apostle Paul and lay it down. And this is the way God deals with humanity, with men. And I'll tell you something this morning. He's dealt with me. There have been times God got my attention. There have been times God got a hold of me and I knew it was from heaven. I knew it was from the Lord. I knew where it was coming from. Some of you in this house today are living a life you know is in rebellion against God. You know you're running from God or you know that you're doing something God doesn't want you to be doing. You know you're hiding somewhere. There's a thousand things to do. But you know it's not the way it ought to be. But you just keep going on and on and on because you think maybe God doesn't really see or maybe he doesn't really care. It really doesn't matter that much. But if you're a born again believer, something down inside your soul is not settled. And you know, you know that the day is going to come when your loving heavenly father look at the devil and say, Satan, shut up. He belongs to me. He or she is mine. And then Satan begins to condemn and accuse and all oh, how he'll drag your past up. He'll drag up everything you've done. He'll lay it out before you and before God. And he'll say, listen to me, God. If you're just and you're holy and you're righteous, look at all this garbage. How in the world can you have a relationship with him or her based on all this? And that's when God Almighty says, do you see my son right there? Now he'll take you to the cross. And at the cross at Calvary, he paid for every one of those sins. They're all paid for. They're paid for. Yeah, but he's still doing it. Yeah, I know that. That's my department. That's where I come in. I'm accountable. I'm accountable, God says. And the devil said, you better believe you are. You better believe it. How are you going to send me to hell and let him live like that? And God said, watch me. And he said, those I love, I chase and scourge every son that I receive. The chastening hand of God, remember this, is instructive. Instruction, not punishment, not punishment. Instruction, instruction. And, oh, it may hurt like punishment. You may scream and cry and whine and bawl like it's punishment, but it's not punishment. You are punished at the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. Christ was punished in your place. It is instruction, 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 instruction. Those I love, I chase. And I know I'm going to run a... It, I can't preach it all here in, 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 in 45 minutes or an hour, but I want you to notice something in Hebrew. There are two other groups of people over there. One group turns away from the gospel. He said it's impossible to renew them again repentance. Another group trods the blood of the Son of God underfoot. And in neither case is a word said about chastening. Go home and think on that for a while. Not one word with either group. I'll give you the references. Hebrews 5, verses 4 through 6. Hebrews 10, 26 through 29. Not a word about either group being chastened when they turned away from God. You know why? Those I love I chasten. And I scourge every son, every son. If God deals with you as with a son, that's a relationship that cannot be broken. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't break it. Satan would do it in a heartbeat. But once you are his son, you are his son. He says over there in the book of 1 John, if you see a brother sending a son into death, the Bible does not tell you what that sin is, but it tells you a brother can sin a sin unto death. The reason no specific sin is mentioned is because it's not a specific sin. It's about a state of being that you come into as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not what you do, particularly what you are in your relationship to God. The sin will take its course. 
The problem is not what you're doing. The problem is your relationship with God. If you think changing what you're doing is going to affect your relationship with God, then you have gone right back to self-righteousness where you believe that what you do can get you saved or unsaved. Your relationship with God is not built on what you do. Your relationship with God is built on what Christ has already done. And when you accept what He's done for you, that remains constant throughout your life. So if I'm doing something wrong, it's not what I'm doing wrong that's the problem. The problem is what kind of condition my heart's in. It's the state of my being before God. That is what leads to death. The Apostle Paul said in Hebrews 12, he said, Why not be subject to the Father of spirits and live? Live. God wants you to live. I hear somebody say, Well, preacher, if I go out here and do such, I don't care what you go out here and do. The fact that you want to go out here and do it is the problem. The problem is your heart. The heart is the issue. Not with doing. Doing will always take its place. You get the donkey or the mule and hook him up to the cart and turn the mule loose and the donkey loose and the cart's following the donkey, everything's fine. But put the cart in front of the donkey and you got a problem. And that's what so much theology is. It's all about doing and not about being. Because you can fool people by doing, but you'll never fool God by doing. I'll give you three things and I'll close. God's interested in what you are, where you are with Him. Get that right and the doing will be right. When I got that saved in 1973, a lot of my doing changed. I was doing wrong. But I didn't get saved because I changed my doing. I got saved because I accepted Christ who changed my doing. So let me give you these three things and I'll shut up and leave you alone. Three things. These are the three states you can fall into. Number one, rebellion. No authority from God. Anarchy. One man sung it this way. He said, I did it my way. Well, I don't know where he went when he left this world, but it was not his way. I did it my way. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. You'll have no authority over you. Nobody's going to tell you how to live. Nobody's going to tell you what's right. If you choose to live a certain way, you're going to live that way. If you're going to live according to the pop culture in the country you live in, people fornicate and shack up around here. They get doped up. They, they cuss and blaspheme God. They get up on the stage and strip off. I mean, this is a country where... where the, and let me tell you something else about America. Let me tell you what's happened to America. In my few years on this earth, here's what I've noticed in the last five years. I have never seen in my lifetime as many shallow relationships as we have today. Nobody puts their heart in anything. How many agree? And the church, the church is 35 miles long and a quarter inch deep. That's how deep the church is. In other words, it's just as shallow. Nobody's heart's in anything. No relationship is permanent. No relationship is tie knot, join. You're my friend. You become my friend. You're going to be my friend. You're going to be my friend if hell freezes over. You're going to be my friend if the devil tries to destroy us. You're going to be my friend regardless of what you do. We're going to be friends till we die. A friend sticketh closer than a brother. You got a friend like that? Or have you got a fair weather friend? He said, I'm the friend of sinners. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. And then here's the second one unbelief, particularly the Word of God. The Bible is something they use, like a, like a, uh, uh, like a drill. Uh, like a like a jackhammer, like a like a like a wrench, like a socket, like a like a like a any kind of electric tool. It's just something they use. I don't believe it. These professional clergy and in the pulpits all over the country, they use this book, but they don't believe a word in it. 
It's just something they use. That's unbelief. And then third, there are those who twist and pervert the Scripture and they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and make it a license to sin. Now think about a state of being. This is a state of being you can fall into. A rebel, an unbeliever, a more, I'm talking about a believer that becomes an unbeliever, and then one who turns the grace of God into lasciviousness. Once you get into a state like that, it can lead to all kinds of sins. But where you are is in a, you are in a situation where a sin unto death becomes prevalent in your life. Well, what can change me, preacher? The Father above that loves us. When he lays his hand on your soul, when he begins to move in your life, he's doing it because he loves you. Because you see, folks, when sin is finished, what does it bring forth? Amen. Inevitably, you're not going to change that. That's a law. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Sin, Paul said in Romans 7, that works in my members will bring forth death. Some of you will die a, a, a premature death because sin is going to kill you. He wants to keep you alive unless he has a reason to take you out of here. And if he keeps you alive, the way he keeps you alive is by chastening you and purging the killer from your life. Amen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Bless his holy name. When God chastens this old boy right here, you ought to say, I say, hallelujah. If he chastens you, you ought to say, hallelujah. Glory to God, I knew it was coming and he showed me I belonged to him. Amen. Ain't that good? <laughs> Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your holy name. Bless your word. May it help somebody. May it help them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.